Now, a lot of you, if you're really into your deer habitat and you're hunting, you're starting to look at how can you plan for a better season? That's so why we get a lot of client contacts this time of year where our email's full and Jesse's working feverishly to, to schedule clients. I, I believe I'm down to um, just September in Ohio. Might be my last uh, trip to schedule. And then I'm scheduled for the year, um, 84 clients. So Dylan's been working on his, is, I don't know if it's half full now, but it's it, getting there. Um, you have a lot of clients anyways. And I know Joe is almost all, all the way full. And then Kevin's working on his too, he's about halfway full. So, but anyways, this is a big time of the year for us. I have a friend, uh, Brian, up in uh, north of the cities. He, he always, always texts me back and forth. He was a previous client, a uh, client of Dylan's actually, and become friends. And he's always talking about what he's going to do on his property. And this is that time to plan. And I think sometimes we can get away from January and you start getting involved in other things. And all of a sudden you're trying to slam everything together in July and August. And, and you don't get the effect of starting early and really building something, especially big picture. And when it comes to big picture and really moving deer where you want them to and recognizing where they move, and it's no different if you're scouting on public land and building on private, but you can say all the time, but there's nothing better than connecting doe hotspots. And what I mean by that is when you have that ability on private land to build it the way you want, you're looking at an overall movement that is never ending on your property. Now it might mean that you might have big public land next to you and it comes from public land, goes back to public land, but you're sending them to safe areas, areas you can already hunt to and take advantage of. You're not sending deer on and off your neighbors at a predictable rate so your neighbor can sit across the line and shoot deer. I remember long ago I was at a habitat day and the guy was out there and he was we were in a little habitat tour and we were talking about things that are going on the land and um, the uh, the owner of the land talked about the guy off the his neighbor off his border about 30 yards away with a tree stand. He didn't like it. And so he'd run a chainsaw on opening day of gun season in that area and make sure the deer guy didn't see any deer. That was the, the I thought anyways. But the landowner had a long, narrow food plot pointed right at his neighbor's border. So where do you think the deer would cross? They'd cross predictably right on that fence. He had a 200 yard long food plot pointing at there. The food plot ended about 50 yards from the border and that was a smart neighbor to put a stand there because he was taking advantage of the, the long and big improvement that the landowner had made. And so you're looking at connections that keep deer on your property, don't end, don't push them off your property, and you're connecting those. And so I'm gonna talk about some of these connections, and you can guess this is where we have tree stands too. So number one, a mock scrape here. Every time we have a stand location and we put a stand, we're considering where would we put a camera if we had to add a camera there, where would we put a mock scrape, and where would we put a stand location? Those three things go together. They have to. Mock scrape being we put one at every stand location, every blind. That's our connection of movements. So when a deer comes through that area, they focus on that hanging mock scrape that we put out there, that vertical scrape. We find those work the best because they attract does and fawns as well as bucks. We had a really cool study we did from the end of September to the end of November this year. We had a mock rub in combination with a mock scrape. And we had 22 bucks hit the mock rub, 22 different unique hittings. Sometimes they'd hit it, step back, hit it again, or whatever. But uh, now in scrapes, we had 210. So 210 versus 22. Now, obviously, every hit on the rub was a, what, all 22 were box. With the scrape, we had 210. 64 were box. The rest were split evenly between does and fawns. That's about what you see a third, a third, a third. Meaning all deer that walk by hit the mock scrape. If done correctly, we'd use a vertical scrape right over the trail. We have over 50 scrape videos, so you can check that out and learn how we do that. It's pretty easy, no expense to you, really little to no expense, maybe some par paracord. The bottom line is we're connecting these spots because we have that mock scrape at every location. We expect deer to travel from there, point A to point B. At point B, we have another stand location, we have another mock scrape. Sometimes we have a water hole. A water hole is another hot spot. So think about that. That mock scrape is there, doe is visiting that, leaving her scent. Fawn is leaving their scent on that mock scrape. Water hole, does are using that. We don't use a water hole at every stand location. On a typical 40, we might have two if it's dry, maybe three if it's really hilly. On a typical 200 acre parcel, you might have five or six. It's not like you increase exponentially as the acres go up the number of water holes. It's not, that wouldn't fit. So you don't have as many water holes and mock scrapes, but it's still the same focus. We have them in the woods away from major food sources, and we have them in combination because we already have a mock, a mock scrape at that stand location, so if we had a water hole, we have both of them. A lot of times I wanna make sure, most times, I wanna make sure that the camera can view both, so I can get a picture of a buck if he visits either one 
in that specific area. Another spot that does will frequent. And well, why does, we'll get to that in a second, but lay of the land. Deer are going to naturally move through the property following saddles, benches, edges, habitat changes, where all habitat comes together, inside corners, funnels. Funnels meaning a constriction of habitat, so it narrows down where all deer move through, most wildlife in general move through. And that's piecing together with mock stripes, piecing together with water holes, and you can kind of get the picture. We're starting to put these dots together because in a long movement of three or 400 yards, you might have several mock scrapes because you have several stands. You might have one or two water holes, two at the most, and, and something like that, one on each end. And then you'd actually have uh, water holes here and there but then they're connecting with that natural movement, that lay of the land where they're already moving. So really important. Edge of habitat. Deer will travel on the edge of habitat. So where habitat changes, say a swamp edge with a hardwoods, they're gonna follow that line. So again, if you're looking at, well, I'm gonna blow my scent into the open hardwoods, but I'm gonna hunt this swamp edge, I'm gonna have food plot or a uh, water hole, I'm gonna have a mock scrape, then it's all fitting together. And then also food. Food is a really big one. And I'm going to add bedding in here. I, I should put that in there because that is a connection. So we'll call this seven bed. And we'll call this eight. <laughs> we'll make that into a, a dirty eight. Anyways, exactly how bucks move. But we'll add bedding in there because when you connect dough bedding, major food sources, mock scrapes, water holes, lay of the land, edge of habitat when you put all those together that's how doe and deer in general move through your landscape and with within the case of mock scrapes and water holes even food plots you're predicting these deer are going to move in this location but you're connecting all the dots and i think that's what a lot of folks fail when they're making habitat improvements they're making habitat improvements by location meaning it's random meaning this is a good spot for a food plot so we put it here this is a good spot for a water hole, so we put it here. This is a good spot for edge habitat to build a doe bedding, but nothing relates to each other. You want to connect all these dots so that if you have 40 acres, each one of these locations might be going around in a pattern so that you can connect the dots of movement for deer and then hunt the outside with stand locations. Or maybe you have your cabin in the middle and you're hunting this way. But well, bottom line is you're connecting these features, not that these deer are running around in a circle, but when they come through the area, you're connecting it. And in the end, that's how exactly bucks move throughout the parcel. So look at this as you're connecting doe hotspots. What a great spot to hunt then when you're putting all those connections and why it becomes so definitive where bucks move because they're just focusing on all these doe hotspots, especially those water holes, mock scrapes, edge of habitat, lay of the land, these natural crossings and funnels, those bucks can move through there, look for doe scent, and they're always hitting another hot spot. And the more definition of improvement that you create or that you recognize in public land, the more definitive your hunting is and how successful your hunting is going to be. I'll give you the opposite. The opposite is a big open hardwoods, no scrapes, no water, no bedding areas, no edge of habitat, flat, no lay of the land, no topography changes, where are they gonna move? Yeah, I don't know either. There's no place for them to move and connect the dots. So really think about connecting dots in your land this year, that big picture of movement. That's we talk about what we did last year, what we've done in the past where we go in and say, this is gonna be a great rut morning setup. We set it up uh, last year, what we did, we had the big bedding area we cut, water hole, mock scrape, our access, where we're blowing scent into for the thermals. It takes a lot of strategic planning to put it all together. And then that relates to all the other movements around there too, again, so that we're moving to your parallel to our borders. We're keeping them on our borders. We're not pushing them over to a, a heavily pressured area. And think about connecting these hot spots, whether you're creating it on private or finding it on public land. And that'll directly lead you to success, not only in recognizing deer movement and creating it, but then of course hunting it and finding success with filling your tag this coming deer season. 
Hey, I'm really excited to introduce to you our Hills and Thermals web class. It's something we worked on all year. We're trying to put lots of facets of scouting, aerial imagery, diagrams on the whiteboard to really teach you how the wind moves through hills and how you should find bedding areas, how it relates to deer movements in general, how that relates to you. This is a bedding area stand. This is a food source afternoon stand. We really tried to put this together and offer you a complete picture of how to navigate hills and find better success consistently where you hunt.